There should be, really. I think you deserve one after saying my titles without any mistake, which is quite wonderful. Well, I'm really very happy to be here and consider uh, this uh, as being among old friends, although I don't know all of you personally. Toronto is one of my favorite places where I went in the past and now I'm going every week and I really look forward to this series of visits to this pleasant city and this pleasant uh, uh, center. I'm also very honored to give the Northrop Fry lectures, uh, although I would of course not be so presumptuous to compare my work to Northrop Fry's. And although if I did, the differences would be more striking than the similarities, I share with Professor Fry an interest in larger cultural issues, if I can put it that way, um, in mythical discourse and more specifically in the Bible. And there will be some Bible in this series, not much. And it, uh, if it is the interest in larger cultural is issues that brought it here, it's, uh, that brought me here, it certainly uh, generated in me the um, desire to explore not what separates the different art forms and media, but what binds them, what they have in common. And this series of lectures is an exploration of those aspects that verbal and visual arts share. In a way, I could say uh, it's about the verbality in visual arts and the visuality in literature. It circles around Rembrandt, and that is because I'm fascinated by his work in the first place, but also because he stands for something. He stands for a cultural place of prestigious art, of high art. And I want to raise some issues uh, that have a connection to that problem of canonization and the popularity of some arts. Now, can you all hear me, even behind here, yes? If not, just interrupt. In general, feel free to interrupt if you feel like discussing things that I'm saying, because it's going to be kind of wild feminist stuff today and next week, and uh, you may want to uh, challenge some of that. Um, we are going to talk about rape today, to begin with an interesting subject. Now, in the rape will be a case, a case of a gen more general point. The point being that in art, be it literary or visual, nothing is natural and everything is artificial. Everything is also real. That is, art is part of reality. Art is, of course, fully artificial, not a given, but a construct. Everybody knows that, but what are the consequences of that is the question. And its cultural position gives it a solid place in reality, of which it is a part and to which it responds, which it helps to construct and also sometimes to deconstruct. The work of art between construction and deconstruction, between representation and creation, takes shape within the cultural context in which it emerges and in which, from which it emerges and in which it functions. That context is not as specialized as the divisions of academic studies in the universities today would suggest. A culture is not just verbal or visual, although we have departments of verbal art and departments of visual art more of the one than of the other, by the way. Therefore, the relations between specific works of art and their context can be analyzed on the basis of the assumption of the co-temporal presence among the tools of artistic expression of the primary cultural means of communication, that is, visuality and ver verbality. I don't know, that word doesn't exist, verbality, but I want a parallel to visuality. Please come up with a good alternative if you find one. Now, in order to explore the basis and the consequences of this assumption, I want to discuss a case, and the case is rape. Why rape? That will become clear today. Now, the case is a cultural problem related to the representation of a subject. It's popular in culture, as a representation, that is, maybe also as a practice. It is difficult to represent. How do you represent rape? Yet it is often represented, and it is awfully real. So that seems a good case for what I want to, to question. Now, the analysis aims at understanding the margins of that case, the seams where art is attached to reality, and at foregrounding the artificial quality of the artistic utterances. The case all is rape, then the subject is Lucretia, the tool is rhetoric, and the interpretation is feminist. This is about today and next week. 
it's a double session. The next one will also be double. So if you if you attend only half of it, it will be a little awkward. So you, I'm afraid that if you're not coming back next week, you, you will not really get the point. This is not to force you to come back next week. It's rather to encourage you to leave the room now if you know that you want, don't want to come back next week. So I will devote two sessions to this case. One today primarily on visual art, on visual material, and the other one next week primarily on the literary material. Now those who take the, this seminar for credit should look in the reading list and read the titles indicated there, except for the article in style that is not yet out. You will read that later. It's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. It would be nice if it had been available, but it's not. And uh, that's, that's not a real problem. I have indicated for every session some uh, reading assignments for those who take the course for credit. And those who are so fascinated that they want to do as if can also read that uh, material. And I'm sure it's put on reserve somewhere. And David um, will, will make sure that you can uh, get a hold of it. Um, the, today, you don't miss anything if you didn't read anything for today. You will miss a lot if you don't read for next week. I, ha I put some times in the syllabus for those who want to pursue this question. That is, there is reading that you can read if you want to develop for your own term paper, for example, this, sub this particular subject. So the book on real rape here is not necessary for the session itself. It's just for your uh, suggestion for further reading. The other texts are absolutely necessary. Uh, that is, you can hardly follow if you haven't seen the Ovid and the, and the Livy and the Shakespeare. It's short text, so you can easily find that. Now, Rembrandt, it's not by chauvinism that I picked Rembrandt. It's really, well, I'll tell you some other time when we are just the two of us. Huh? Um, why Rembrandt? But anyway, Rembrandt painted the suicide of Lucrezia twice. The subject of the chaste Roman Lucrezia, who stabbed herself in the presence of her husband and father after she had been raped by her husband's fellow soldier, was a familiar one at the time in antiquity. It was, so to speak, part of the culture. The story received, of course, allegorical interpretations, political and religious. But such an explanation is never sufficient when we are dealing with a persistent, powerful image, a cultural emblem, a cliché, which addresses a real and serious problem, such as rape. That is, getting involved in allegorical interpretations is also trying to get rid of the problem that the work poses. Now, Lucrezia is a good subject to begin our discussion with for three reasons. First, because it's a story, it's narrative, and we want to talk about narrative in art, in visual art. Second, because it was often painted. It was really a cliché among painting, among different uh, paintings. Third, because it has been and still is popular. People know it, people recognize it, and look at it. Hence, it makes a good case for the questions I want to uh, begin with. What are the relations between cultural fascination, verbal and visual representation, and how does rhetoric serve to connect these? That is, I want, to, um, I want to address questions of reception. How can we work <coughs> with the tools of literary analysis in the analysis of a painting and then see how we can get to something real? Now, in this sequence of two lectures, then, rape will be considered in its semiotic aspects. Two levels of semiotic aspects for rape. One, the semiotic behavior surrounding rape, such as the difficulty of telling the experience, the refusal to listen to survivors, the semiotic use of rape for other purposes, like the political use here in the Lucrezia story to inaugurate a revolution because of the rape. Those are, th that is one level surrounding, of semiotic behavior surrounding rape. And then there is the other level, the semiotics of rape itself, that is, its status as body language, as a speech act, an act of aggression an, that really expresses aggression, as an attempt to destroy, which equates it with murder. And we'll see that uh, in the culture, this equation really works. Difficulties of getting across the semiotics of rape on both levels 
due to the nature of the act as well as the cultural uh, attitudes towards it, will be pointed out through a detailed analysis of the two Rembrandt paintings, compared with the textual sources of Livy and Ovid, and with the Renaissance verbal representation like Shakespeare's, which to some extent can be compared to, to Rembrandt in terms of historical background. A manner of reading will thus be developed which seems particularly suitable to grasp the artificial construction of rape as well as for the recovery of the unspeakable aspects of the experience of rape. So that, that's something that we want to, we want to try to grasp, what, what the experience of rape, how the experience of rape can be culturally present, talked about, while in fact rape is unspeakable. A perspective on a classical rapish situation. I'm going to use this word rapish and rapishness, and I don't have to explain what I mean by that, and I will soon, you will soon see through the example. So, a perspective on a classical rapish situation on the one end, and brief remarks on textual versions of the same story, and on another ancient rape tale on the other, will help to generate a view of rape that will then even more briefly be compared with confronted with women's rape stories and see because all these classical rape cases rape stories are male uh, have male authors and that is of, of course significant in itself for an experience that is so tied to uh, femininity now the share of visual rhetorics in a reading of rape will prove indispensable that is going to be my claim and you can you're most welcome to contradict it after I uh, make the case or while I make the case so this first case will show the point of what I call a visual poetics as a cultural critique. So my point is not so much whether I'm right or wrong in the interpretation that I'm going to present, but to what extent this kind of interpretations, this, this strategy of interpretation can work as a critique. Now, first a long detour, a detour on good old Freud. We can't do without him. And I'm not going to talk about Dora, don't worry. Although that, there, is, there is some rapishness in Dora, but about something that is not rape at all. You know about Geoffrey Masson's collage of Freud's letters to, to, uh, to Fleece. Now those letters reveal, among other things, the following scene. And those of you who know his Geoffrey Masson's book will recognize immediately the scene. It's not a scene of rape. Emma Eckstein, whose nose was operated for pains in her abdomen, deemed hysterical, feels extremely unwell and suddenly begins to have life-threatening nose bleedings. Freud calls upon a competent specialist who examines the patient. This specialist suddenly bends forward and pulls out of Emma's nose a piece of half-rotten gauze, two feet long. That's the scene kind of gruesome. Now in this event, Freud, contrary to what one would expect, does not find support for his real trauma theory of hysteria, the theory that he had in the beginning, the assumption that hysteria came out of a real trauma in the past. No, to the contrary, in his written reports about this to Fleece, remember Fleece had operated this woman and had left the galls in her nose, which caused these nose bleedings. Now, in his written reports to Fleece, he gradually turns the nose bleedings, consequences of the misplaced operation and the mistreatment of the patient by error, into symptoms of the hysteria that the operation was supposed to cure. And if you read the letters, you see this gradual shifting, shifting, shifting until he says, well, it was all hysterical. And actually, he claims that she was in love with him. What else could it be? Now, two aspects of this case will detain us here, of this event. First, the displacement. Displacement all over the place, to use the expression. The operation on the nose for stomach pains strongly reminds me of ancient theories of hysteria, as recalled by Charles Bernheimer in the introduction to Indora's case, you know, that volume that came out in Colum uh, with Columbia Press a few years ago on feminist readings of the Dora case. 
and we could talk about the Dora case as, at length in uh, terms of rape, but uh, we won't do that today. Theories of the wandering uterus that had to be domesticated. In, in, in ancient times, hysteria was seen as, that's why it's called hysteria, hysteria meaning uterus. Hysteria was supposed to be a uterus going, uh, gone uh, out sailing through the body. And they used good smells to pull it back to place on the one end, or bad smells to put it back, to push it away back to its place on the other end, to cure hysteria. Now, the operating someone on the nose for pains in the belly, this seems the same kind of uh, interesting, uh, wandering uterus uh, uh, idea. Now, the displacement, and take displacement in its etymological sense of spatial dislocation, take something out of here and put it there, as well as its psychoanalytic sense of distortion and through distortion of censorship on the other, of censorship hiding the uncomfortable truth. This displacement seems a key figure in both the story of the operation, the scene of the two men observing the suffering and almost destroyed woman, and the signs, the signs in this scene. Now, among the signs which I see in the scene are, in the first place, a lot of blood. She was bleeding to death, actually. And then the woman's powerless position, lying on the, confined to her bed, she couldn't stand up, she was too weak, and then those two men standing at the bedside, bending over her, but with a radical separation, of course, between two competent doctors and a dying woman. So uh, you, you can picture that scene, and I'm asking you to strongly imagine the scene visually, just visually. Now, the second aspect, if you have this picture in mind of all that blood on the sheets and everywhere, and this white woman, her face probably as white as the sheets because she had lost all her blood, and those two guys standing there. Now, the second aspect of this event is language. Emma does never speak to us. We have no account from her about her story. She does not tell her story, her experience, and her feelings. We get to see the scene through Freud's language. And his story is distorted. His interest turns out to be the interest in the strong German sense, and not, not in the uh, sense of we are interested in, but his, his, his orientation turns out to be displaced, and systematically so, from Emma to Fleece, from her suffering to his apology. It is like the uh, apology of Raymond Sebon in, in Montaigne. It's a whole discourse to apologize for Fleece, who made this blunder. And the blunder has to be wiped out. So in the letters, you see this gradual wiping out of the, of the mistake by turning it into the cause of the problem. That is, you don't hear about the mistake, which was a consequence of the operation, but you hear about that she was hysterical, and that's why the nose bleedings. Now, the intriguing question is, how can we know about Emma's situation? How this picture that I asked you to form in your mind, how do we get it? We can, how can we infer her experience from the account, which is ex exclusively given by the other, and other in the strong sense? We can see it visually on the basis of Freud's verbal account. But what kind of semiotic do we need in order to read the unsaid in this story, to recover the repressed and to interpret the distorting signs of that unspeakable experience? We need to account for the obliqueness of representations whose rhetoric is aimed at blurring over, blurring out the woman's experience, yet which cannot entirely repress those experiences. That's the interesting thing. Although we only have the account of someone who works, who writes for the effacement of the experience, we still get it. We have the, the, this whole story I'm telling you, and I'm sure you were terribly impressed by the story, right? It comes out of Freud's language. Now, the Emma story allows us to let her experience get through the censorship by its visuality, is, is my, uh, my sense about this story. Although it's entirely verbal, Freud's account promotes visual imagination, or let's say that's a way that it allows to see what really happened. This visual aspect, which can only be realized when we read the text with visual imagination, in the first place, and then with identification with the victim in the second place. That's what I want to explore further in this uh, session, how you do this. 
so far we can conclude from this first instance that we need a visual kind of poetics which is imaginative, identifying and visual. Such a poetics cuts across traditional word image oppositions in order to fill in images where words predominate and words where images repress words. And this is in fact what is today becoming a new field of academic study, the word and image kind of interest. There are a lot of, there's a lot of work done and American uh, people who, who have been doing this for a while are Wendy Steiner and uh, Tom Mitchell in Chicago and um, Norman Bryson in Great Britain who is now coming to the United States like everybody else and um, who has a wonderful series of books that I highly recommend you to read. One is called Word and Image, one is called Vision and Painting and one um, tradition and desire. And that field of study, in fact, my project now could be considered part of that exploration of those relations. Now, such a poetics, such a way of reading that I want to set up here, is moreover based on shifting and displacing back. That is, if we get an, a, a document like this, these, this correspondence with Fleece, a document that is full of displacements, we have to see the displacement in order to shift back. Hence, it involves a rhetorical reading of the visual, displacement being a rhetorical device. It is a poetics which, in honor of the wandering womb of ancient hysteria, I would like to call a hysterics. And with hysterics, I mean, footnote, because I have had misunderstandings about this, this hysterics or hysterical poetics, which is in the first place a joke, but uh, really not only, is a search for the, for the displaced, the unsaid, but often visible, sign of unspeakable experiences. It is not unlike Naomi Shore's notion of clitoral hermeneutics, another of those nice jokes that really stick in your mind, in its systematic displacing of accents, but it is not identical with Naomi Shore's um, concept in that hysterics is not limited to the detail mainline reversal, which is basically what she means by clitoral hermeneutics, kind of deconstruction of the <coughs> relation between detail and mainline, which is only part of this uh, hysterics. Hysterics focuses on the possibility of systematic redisplacement and exploits considerations, in Freudian terms, considerations of representability. Rücksicht auf Darstellbarkeit. Okay, is that it? The, ter the Freudian term is again an exploitative, no, this, this idea of putting considerations of representability in, in, in this bag of, of tools that I'm trying to develop here is again an exploitative recuperation of a Freudian term that was used in another direction. And I can refer to Samuel Weber's, or Weber's um, wonderful analysis of and critique, in fact, of the Freudian term. It, the, the term does not refer to the dreamer or writer or painter, as it does in, in Freud's account, but to the reader or viewer who will, within hysterics, exploit the representations, visual or otherwise imaginable status, that is, who will systematically try to imagine visually what is going on. Needless to say, the term does not at all refer to the feminist debate about privileging hysteria as a wonderful feminine state of mind as was in the 1970s debated and debatable and um, it has nothing to do with that either. That's the misunderstanding that I once got. So the term refers to the notion of that the repressed will force its way out in hyst hysteria or otherwise. It doesn't matter, it doesn't lead to hysteria to do this, I can tell you. Similarly, I will force the story of rape as a female experience out of, normally one would use here to tease out of the text, but I think that's not strong enough, so I'll say I'll force it out of there. Force the experience out of the man's account of rape that repressed the women's stories. And the term is a metaphorical one, of course, which alludes to an image of hysteria, that of the wandering womb, not of the reality. And it proposes to read literally exactly as hysterics aims to do. Now, such a hysterical poetics that I'm proposing here, and 
we'll have time to discuss it, especially next time if today uh, we won't go into it. But you'll see in the course of this whole seminar what I really mean by this, this funny term. Now, such a hysterical poetics is semiotic in the first place, in that it recuperates science, nonverbal science, as much as verbal science. If Emma does not speak, her silence is sign number one. And we have Lotman, good old Lotman, on our side here with the zero prion uh, device. The visual image of the scene shows the two standing men. Remember Freud and the doctor and the, the other doctor? It was not Fleece who was there because he wrote to Fleece afterwards. Fleece was absent. That was precisely the problem. The two standing men collaborating together the togetherness of the two men in the situation and the loneliness of the woman are relevant uh, aspects. Observing, the observing attitude as a medical case versus the observed woman, alone, too sick to participate in any way, utterly powerless and on her way to total destruction. The piece of gauze as an alien body introduced by violence and destroying the subject of from within. It wasn't even visible. Now, this is exactly how I will interpret rape. An alien body introduced by for violence and destroying the subject from within. The refusal or the incapacity or the unwillingness to focus attention on the victim and the determination to displace that attention to the perpetrator, as Freud does with Fleece, whose reputation is at stake and who has to be protected becomes itself a sign of the powerful displacement that the hysterical reading aims to counter. For what Freud's very attempts to apologize for fleas reveal is not only the particular distribution of interests, but also the lack of logic in his endeavor. And you know that Freud was, more than anyone else, was, was out, set out to be logical. That he needed to be logical because he had to set up his theory against a whole positivistic scientific environment, and logic was all he had because he didn't have empirical evidence. Well, there is a lot of lack of logic sometimes in his work, and here's one case. This lack of logic points up the displacement they are trying to conceal. It's there where things don't match that you know that there is something behind. Now, what Freud cannot unwrite in all his letters, although he tries hard, is the detail to come back to, to Shore's work, which I highly recommend um, in this respect and in general. What Freud cannot unwrite is the detail, the evidence, that is, the piece of gauze. Now, we are going to set out to discover pieces of gauze in all the material about Lucretia. Rather than reading for the plot, to allude to Peter Brooks, a hysterical semiotics reads for the image, reads for the detail. And rather than reading for the hero, or the main character, another of those categories, it will read for the victim. Rather than reading for logic, linearity, and literality, literality it displaces these and replaces them with a scene-oriented, scene like in theater, a scene-oriented <coughs> simultaneity in which the categories of literal and figural change places. Rather than in the historical past, this kind of reading places the event in the hysterical presence, present of identification, which receives its figuration from the spatial dimension. That is, we will just not worry too much about, his, about history in the sense of chronology, narrativity, etc., but just see what's there. And you will see that that's even with a painting, that's not easy to get rid of the story. Now, read hysterically, the scene of Emma's nose bleeding then becomes a figuration of a rape scene. And I reread that definition. A piece of gauze is an alien body introduced by violence and destroying the subject from within. Now, with this preliminary uh, example of a scene that's not a rape scene really, but uh, comes close, we can go to see, to look at Lucretia, the heroine of rape, if ever there was one celebrated all through Western culture. Why would that be? Well, she killed herself after the rape, calling for revenge. And her death initiated the revolution that led to the Roman Republic. 
now this sudden, suddenly I'm hit by a question. Did I put in the assignment for next week? No, I didn't. For next week, there was also Judges 19 in the Bible. You know the Bible, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, Judges, seventh book of the Hebrew Bible, second of the historical books, chapter 19. I'm sorry, I should have put it in the syllabus. Because I'm just thinking about it, because Lucretia's death leads, uh, rape leads to the Roman, the Roman Republic, while in uh, Judges 19, the rape leads to the kingdom. So it doesn't really matter what it leads to, as long as it leads to something political rather than personal. Now, as a mythical story, Lucretia being a very strong surviving mythical story, we may assume that the legend speaks to the culture that brought it forth, as well as to the culture that maintained it and reproduced it over and over again. And that is until recently, the, la the one I didn't do in systematic research, but there is a book on all the cases and there, is, there are hundreds and hundreds of versions in theater, in painting, in um, poetry, in opera. There is an opera by Benjamin Britten, written, I don't know, the opera was maybe the early 50s, but the, the text based on which it is based was written in 1946 and was really an allegory on Nazi uh, Germany and the war, and which is exactly another case of allegorizing the story and turning the rape experience into something else. Now, on your reading list for next time, there's also an, an African novella called The Rape of Chevy, which is written by a woman, and which also brings rape in a relation to a political issue. And I hope to talk a little bit about the difference of this use of rape in a political context. Okay, now, in order to try out what hysterical poetics can do to bring back Lucretia's experience, and now, mind you, I'm not going to pretend that this is a reading of the paintings that is in any way going after the intention of the painter. Don't misunderstand the claims of, of this paper. I'm talking about what we can do now with these works of culture. So in order to bring, to see what hysterical poets can do to bring back Lucretia's experience in the representations of a story which deploys all its strategies to ignore and blur out that experience, I want to discuss these two works by Rembrandt. Rembrandt, in fact, painted, he had also, he has also one drawing, but that's, that's a really sketchy thing, not very interesting. He painted two Lucretias, both now in the USA, in a typical imperialist uh, displacement. Both stunning masterpieces, both late works, one in 60, 1664, which is now in Washington in the National Gallery, please go see it, has been out for years because it was clean, uh, it had a cleaning, uh, it was in a workshop for cleaning, but it's out on display now. And the other one in 1666 in Minneapolis. And he died in '69, and you know that he was—he got—he died at age uh, 64. So this is really the end of his career and the end of his life, the last phase. These visual images lend themselves to the kind of hysterical reading that Emma Sickbed has suggested. Just as the sick Emma, I'm just a, sh a brief comparison. Just as the sick Emma was confronted by two healthy men, Lucretia is here facing more than one man and this in several respects. First, according to the myth, Lucretia killed herself in the presence of her father and her husband, the two legal owners. And in some versions, also in the presence of another friend of her husband. It was a, f a kind of colleague of her husband who raped her, but there was a friend of her husband, Brutus, Brutus, uh, I don't know how you pronounce Latin here, uh, who then took the knife out of her body and went outside to preach the revolution. Secondly, just as Freud wrote his story of Emma so much for fleas that we can almost, all, almost say that they wrote it together. That is, he wrote it in identification with fleas. Just so Rembrandt, a man, and probably his students, because you know that Rembrandt was a studio artist, and 
I can refer, not yet, but uh, Svetlana Alpes, you know about her book on the art of describing Dutch art in the 17th century. She has a book in press now with Chicago, which is all on Rembrandt as a studio artist. He hardly ever painted alone, which sheds an interesting light on the contradictions of this Rembrandt research project that goes about the world telling you whether your painting is worth six millions or six thousand dollars, right? Um, that is really a very contradictory uh, endeavor, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, Rembrandt and his students, all male, he did it, there is no knowledge of any female student, represented Lucrezia. So there's again a writing of an experience of rape by a, a number of men collectively. Thirdly, just as the spectators at Emma's sickbed are outsiders, indifferent onlookers, observing her as a case, just so are the men who observe Lucrezia's suicide. They are outsiders, they just stand there and watch. But then what about us, the spectators, outside the painting, are also comparable to the readers of Freud's letters. If we can read Freud's letters to Fleece and get Emma's story, Emma's scene, the visuality of that scene and all the blood out of it, we can also take the option to read this, these paintings hysterically. And it is such a hysterical reading that reveals the extent to which rape and murder are semiotically related. And finally, to make my own position clear, just as I read Masson's selection of Freud's letters with the idea of rape in my mind, because it was in the context of Masson's evidence that Freud had suppressed the real rape experience, just so I had my first experience with, these, with at least one of the the first of the two Lucretias, and before seeing the other one, in a situation that felt rapish. That was in 1985, I was in the National Gallery and the painting was missing. So I inquired and then I got to see the curator and we went down to the workshop. And you know that in the painting world, they don't talk about it, but about she, when the painting represents a woman. And so this man took me to the workshop and there was this painting covered by a veil, and he took it off and said, here she is. And it was not very light there, it was really kind of weird. <laughs> I felt indiscreet, right? Absolutely. Now let me give you my first impressions of the painting, but before I'll do something that I should have done, oh, excuse me, in the beginning, I brought copies, not very many, maybe just not enough, I brought copies for you to keep of the painting, of both paintings. I'm also showing them because of the color. Could you maybe pass around in two of them? If, if there are any left, I would like to take them back because they're kind of very good copies and very expensive. But it's worth it because we are going to talk for hours on these two paintings, I'm afraid. You must tell me if you want a break. Um, I don't know. Are you used to have breaks in these sessions or not? It's pretty much up to you. And well, and the I can talk for hours. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a great talker. As soon as once I start, you don't get me out of here. But just tell me if you want a break, right? Now, first impressions. And now imagine that you, it's, it's the painting on the left of your two copies, the first one, it's the Washington one, the earlier one. Imagine that you see that alone, not in a gallery, where there are a lot of people, where you're anonymous, but you are there and then suddenly someone takes the veil off and you see this. Now, my first impression was her movement away from my voyeuristic gaze, her turning away her head and the deadly color on her face. That was the other thing, you can't see that. Let me quickly show it to you. Can you turn off the light for a moment? Now this is really a pretty good slide and the color on her face is absolutely deadly. I'm afraid, if you, could you leave the door open so that we can see the slide uh, and give me some light that is just enough to read, okay? Um, so, Th those were the two aspects, her turning away and the deadly color. Now the curator of the Department of Northern Baroque, Professor Wheelock, rightly said that 
the cleaning, the, because she was, she was, it was being cleaned in the workshop, that the cleaning had brought her back to life. Was the first thing he said. Well, all I was contemplating the deadly color. Her hands had come to the fore. I asked him to explain this. Her hands had come to the fore, which emphasized the force and the surprise of her act of self-killing. And I was struck, well, once I started to examine that uh, assumption of his that it had brought her back to life, I hadn't seen the older, I hadn't seen it before the cleaning. So I can tell, but he really assured me, and I think he, uh, he was right in that. I was struck by two tiny details, and both are visible the one better than the other on this slide, not on your, on, your, um, on your handout. First, the earring. You see the earring? The earring on her left ear does not hang straight. It hangs obliquely. And this suggests movement. Not only her hands move, she's in, caught in the act, but also her head. And that's why I had this sense of her moving away from me. I really thought that she, or I didn't think, but I had this experience of someone is turning away from me in a, mo a movement, not statically. Now, the other detail is the point of the dagger, and I should have a little thing to, well, I can't really move around with this awful uh, mic on my uh, neck, but the, you see the point of the dagger. That is a shadow. It's, pro it's, it's made longer by a shadow of the point. Can you see that? Okay, great. Now, that seem, seems like a doubling of the point of the dagger, and that was really an interesting detail. That suggests a shadow, which in turn suggests a strong emphasis on frontal light, light from the front. And you know about Rembrandt and light, the chiaro scuro, uh, whatever tradition. This is not a case of that so much as it is a case of a camera, a front light, coming in from the front, quite aggressively. Now, like the first Lucrezia, the later one, next one, okay, the later one also represents the suicide rather than the rape. The frontal presentation is even stronger here. She's as if she came more, to, more forwards in relation to the other one. See? Here she is kind of halfway, and then you, she comes to the fore. See that? Now, this white piece of this undergown, or whatever you call it, is also more central, more, is larger. It's like a sheet. The necklace, which in the first one, enhances the frontal pose by its symmetry, is here replaced by the diagonal sash. The face is turned in the other direction. This is just first impression kind of description. Eh? And it's turned, to, it's, so it's turned to her left instead of to her right. And the movement notable in the earlier picture is replaced in the later one with a frozen pose. She doesn't move. The point of the decker has no shadow. The earring hangs straight. The left hand, which was open in the Washington picture, look at the hand, we'll talk about it as if to persuade or to pray, is now holding a cord. And you can ask what kind of cord. The immediate association is curtain or bell cord. Both, maybe. The red gown, that under part, that lower part of the gown bulges, thus pointing at either sitting down or more likely collapse, the beginning of collapsing. She's falling. And maybe she's holding onto that cord to make her falling more who knows, decent or uh, more uh, elegant or whatever. The body sinks into a red mass, one could say. It's not a coincidence, of course, that the gown is red. The tears that you see in the first one, I hope you can see them on the slide. Not really. You see a tear at the corner of the mouth and then a little up from there. It's hard to see, really, but on the painting you see it. The tears are gone in the second one. The earring hangs straight, the dagger points in a different direction, and there is blood on the undergown. Now, reading the earlier painting for the plot, we would interpre interpret the movement as a consequence of the presence of the man. Remember, in the story, her father and her husband were there. 
and they were trying to comfort her and tell her that it was really not her fault. They were quite nice to her. That's not the problem. It's not, I mean, it's not the case that men are always nasty when this happens. They were really nice to her. And then suddenly she pulls a dagger and kills herself. She has to act swiftly, one could say, before they can restrain her, before they can prevent her. That's why this movement. That would be a reading that is realistic. Realistic as an explanation of the detail in terms of the real story. Taking the motivations from the story rather than from the scene as it is visually represented. It is also a verbal interpretation based on a verbal, on a narrativization. It, is superpose, it superposes the painting on an underlying verbal story that the painting is then supposed to illustrate, right? That is what you do if you explain these details in terms of the story. And I will argue that verbality, as I call it for the mieux, of the painting is much more intricated with its visuality than that. So I, I want to try to get away from uh, that, that realistic <coughs> reading. Now, we have to, can you still hear me with this noise of the projector? Just interfere if you don't think it's clear. Starting at these details, we want to look at this for quite a while so that you really take it in. I think one of the mistakes of uh, teaching about visual art is to do it too quickly and to just pass and pass and pass like we do in the gallery, moving from one to the other. And it's really interesting to watch what happens in your own mind when you look at a thing like this for quite a while. So starting at these details, the earring and the doubling of the dagger's point, the emphasis on the act itself becomes the primary sign, that is the movement. The movement away from the spectator on the one hand and the swift taking, uh, drawing of the dagger and then pushing it in her body on the other. The emphasis recapitulates, recapitulates an aspect of the ideology of rape. The emphasis on the movement. Because what's she doing? The idea that the destruction is done by the victim itself, herself. This is a crucial displacement which betrays its own project of censorship. Rape is identified with suicide, not with murder, as it should be. My claim would be that Lucrezia was murdered by Tarquinius, the rapist. And suicide is only a displacement. And I would contend that Lucrezia has become the heroine of rape, not because she was raped, and even not only because she posits herself as a model of chastity, explicitly so in the sources, as you will, will read when you read them, but even more because of this identification with, between rape and suicide. This identification is most explicit in Livy's verbal story, which is the oldest source that we know of. What then is the semiotics of rape that this displaced and misplaced yet inevitable suicide designs? And we will have to talk about that if we want to talk about rape at all. I'll come back to it, but um, one of the problems of rape and of helping uh, survivors is this almost inevitable taking on themselves the perspective of the, of the rapist and the feeling that you did something wrong or you wouldn't have been raped. Now, suicide, if we translate suicide back into, the, into reasonable English, we get self-killing. Or, if you look at the, the Dutch and the German word, you get self-murder. And in, in Dutch, it is self-murder, and that word is much on, under challenge because it has this negative aspect of murder. But in this case, I maintain that that's the right word. So they try to get away from self-murder in Dutch and replace it with self-killing. And that's all right in general for suicide, but here we have self-murder and I want to play with that a little bit. Now, self-killing, self-murder replaces the rape in this representation and in a lot of others. Because rape itself cannot be visualized. It cannot be visualized. Why? Not only because a decent culture would not tolerate such a representation of the act, which is one thing, 
how could a culture tolerate paintings where you see the actual rape? That's one reason, the most uninteresting. But because rape makes the victim invisible, that's another reason why you cannot represent it. It does that literally first in that the perpetrator covers her, right? You don't see her when it's happening. You only see him because he covers her in both senses of the word again. And then figuratively, the rape destroys her self-image, her subjectivity, which is temporarily narcotized and definitively altered and often destroyed. And that is why I put that book by Susan Estridge on the reading list. And you can also <laughs> read in the older book by Susan Brown Miller that um, one of the most striking features that run through all the interviews with rape survivors is that during the, the event, they try to be elsewhere. They, they try to imagine that it's not happening to them, that, this, that they are just watching or that they are uh, doing something else. Get away from what is happening to you, which is a way of getting away from yourself. And that is really dangerously self-alienating. And that is one of the problems that uh, counselors have to deal with. And it's really hard to imagine if you have no experience either yourself or in your close surroundings of, of what happens to someone. Yes? Yes, you have those paintings, but those are actually representations of abduction, not of the rape itself. Huh? The rape of Europe is the same. When she's taken away by the bull, there are a lot of representations of that. But the violence there is the abduction rather than the rape, than the, 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 the actual rape. Yes? That comes closer because it's metaphorical. There are all kinds of ways to get around this taboo. And this is one. I'm not claiming that this is the only one, but this is one way to get around the taboo. And there are other ways. One is to, to, to make an abduction, which is in fact what precedes the actual rape, the scene. This is what, what's, what follows the actual rape. And then you have the metaphors. But abduction is the same word as rape. It is. That's really interesting. We will talk about that next week about uh, Shakespeare's Lucretia. It's not a, a coincidence that in Shakespeare's Lucretia, Lucretia seeks comfort by looking at the painting of Troy, of the War of Troy, and she talks about Helena's, uh, Helen's rape in, the, in terms of rape. And it's true that that's an English language synonymy which I suspect has to do with this taboo. That is, calling abduction also rape is a way of talking about rape without talking about the actual rape. It's, a, it's another way of surrounding it without really actually representing it. Now, finally, why rape cannot be visualized? Because the experience of rape is physically as well as psychologically an inner experience. Rape takes place, in, takes place inside. I'll just switch this off for a few minutes so that we can, <laughs> we can <laughs> hear a little better. And then when I go into the detail of the slide again, I'll, I'll turn it on. In this sense, rape then takes place inside the body. Now, in this sense, rape is by definition, we could say, imagined. It only exists as experience, as memory, as image translated into signs. It is never adequately objectifiable, which is, of course, a problem for the legal aspect of it. As a consequence, the science is all we have. And instead of taking rape then as imagined, therefore not a real issue, I would turn that around and say it is always an issue, because that's the only thing you have. So um, taking the status of rape as semiotics, literally, we must turn this logical consequence that rape is therefore to be dismissed as a case of crime upside down or around and take it as an inherently semiotic case which derives its strength from that status. I'm not trying to suggest a solution to the legal problem, but at least to the psychological and sociological problem of counseling. 
Now, the urgency to listen to survivors becomes then the only way to reach a solution to the dilemma that it poses. Now, representing rape as self-murder, as we see in the painting, displaces rape with the suicide becoming its metaphor. Right? The metaphor, suicide becomes what it really is. And this metaphor convey, conveys the idea that victim, the victim, in fact, is responsible for her own destruction. She kills herself, doesn't she? The element self, in the concept of self-murder, is thus displacing the attention from the rapist to the victim. As a consequence of the non-representability of rape, the spectators or readers or listeners of an account interpret the self-murder as metaphor, hence rhetorically. And then, if that is the case, if it's so easy to represent metaphorically something that is so unspeakable, and later and the swan is, is one of those examples, we can put that to use and extend the use of rhetoric for uh, the, the reading of rape. As, <coughs> as I extended the notion of semiotic into a status of capability to signify the real by this hist hysterical reading project. So let's then apply other rhetorical terms to rape. The importance of this serious, serious attention to rhetoric becomes immediately obvious when we look again at the metaphor of suicide. The idea of metaphor raises the question of the motivation for its occurrence, which relates the vehicle to the tenor, the motivation in the, in the rhetorical sense, what, what relates the, this vehicle, self-killing, self-murder, to the tenor, rape. This motivation is more often than not metonymical, and I remind you of uh, Girard Genet's essay, Metonymy in Proust, where he explains that almost all Proustian metaphors are in fact metonym metonymically motivated, and therefore the, the distinction doesn't really hold. Now, uh, this is to say in this case, it's a sign which represents the rape not by similitude, but in the same way as a consequence can represent its cause or a later event, its predecessor. Read with metonymy, then, we interpret the scene accordingly. Rape is like a form of self-murder, metaphor, because rape leads to self-murder, metonymy. And you see what you do when you just use that other concept. You switch. If we limit ourselves to metaphor, in other words, we displace the responsibility from the perpetrator onto the victim, self rather than murder. If we use metonymy as well, responsibility is displaced back on to where it belongs, to the rapist and the rape as destruction, murder rather than self. And this, this, need to be, this need to read with a complex rhetoric rather than with a simple one is, let's say, the primary rule of our hysterical semiotic. A third rhetorical interpretation can then be brought in as well, synecdoche. You know, and these are the three that people think are the three major figures. Now, self-murder becomes the detail which represents the whole. What's the whole? The entire process from rape to death. Reading synecdochically suggests that Lucretia's raped body part comes to stand for her whole person, just as the act of self-killing, her act which stands for her, comes to stand in its turn for the entire story, the rape and its consequences from rape to revolution, in this case, even. Not only is the rape itself thus brought back into sight, but the rape also recovers its place as the act that brings about the murder of the self. This rhetoric then emphasizes the fact that rape has consequences in the first place, which is something that is not always acknowledged by everybody dealing with rape. It alters the, vic the victim definitively. Someone who has been raped is never what she was before. In this sense, Lucretia's act does not dis de detract from the significance of the rape, but it is part of her position as a rape victim, thus emphasizing the perpetrator's responsibility. The synecdoche represents, then, the rapist as well, since it is the figure that brings back into sight the whole of which, for which the part stands. So here is the rapist. He is part of the represented whole, even if, or included the including the fact that, he is invisible in the paintings. 
and then select the key. My eyes need to adjust <laughs> for two seconds to the lack of light. The movement of those two objects produces a tension. A tension between a static composition, what we tend to think of visual art as something that doesn't move, that is static, and a dynamic effect. In other words, a narrativization, which is not a verbalization. This is a visual narrativization that we have here. That is, the movement does not come out of the previous story that we knew before we started to look at the painting, but it comes from the painting itself. The woman is the subject, in the thematic sense, or rather the object of the representation. She stands right in the middle of the canvas, her body turned directly toward the spectator. The position of the arms, and as I told you, that was the sign of her coming back to life, the position of the arms emphasizes this sense of display. Here she is, standing before us. Seen as a body on display, the upper gown, the white part of her gown up above that, those uh, horizontal lines, which is closed underneath by this kind of, uh, underneath her bosom by this kind of lock has one part of the lock opened. You see that? On both sides of the gown that there is one, it's not completely closed, right? It's as if she had been locked up before and now is opened, violated, open to the chase. Lucrezia has become public, public property by her rape. She has been open to the public. The visual representation of the woman at the moment of her self-killing partakes of this publication, of this making public. Lucrezia is put on display for the eyes of the indiscreet onlooker. And this is something that you don't notice when, you, at least less conspicuously, when you are in the gallery. Because then your own position as a spectator is so comfortable. You are among many others, you're anonymous and you just pass by quickly. But when you look at it for a long time, or when you look at it as I did in a kind of separate space, it becomes very obvious that there is indiscretion going on. Now, in the face of this display, with her arms spread as if she were crucified, you almost, you could almost put a nail in that hand, right? Lucrezia turns her face away, as the earrings movement shows very strongly. Read hysterically, this movement appeals to the spectator, as an appeal, really. It makes present the painting's external spectator through a direct address. In terms of poetry, we would call that an apostrophe. This device, which is in, po in lyric, lyric poetry so common, makes the semiosis personal and makes the reader or spectator aware of his or her position. And this is one way in which I would say that Rembrandt as an artist could be redeemed from the charge of, let's say, using rape lightly because there is this very strong appeal. The movement is a speech act, I would say. A speech act, a visual speech act. If Lucretia's turning away is a sign of such an apostrophe, who then is being addressed is the next question. Within the story and within this scene, the father and the husband are present, hence addressable, but the addressee of apostrophe is traditionally out of reach. It's God or the wind or love. Here then, that signifies Lucretia's isolation. Her, her addressee is also out of reach and emphasizes the rhetorical status of her hopeless address. She cannot help. She can turn away, but she cannot help being watched. Synecdochically, you get that word, right? Synecdoche, synecdochically. I don't know if that's a nice word, but at least it's... <laughs> It's, it's, it's a swift, speedy one. Now, the part of the whole reading identifies the appeal to father and husband, the legal owners of this woman, with repulsion of the rapist, please stay away, the illegal, illegal appropriator. Now, outside of the story, the addressees are the spectators, that is, us, metaphorically identified with the witnesses inside the story, because they too witness 
look at somebody who does not particularly want to be looked at. The spectators are hysterically contaminated by the similitude between their position and that of the father and the husband. And in the Livy story, that brute who takes the knife out and goes out and shows, even takes the body out and puts it on display on the marketplace. You'll read it when you read the Livy. Now, and even, I would say, through the position of the father and the husband and, and Brutus, that of the rapist, all those men who are there without having any business being there. Lucretia turns her head away in order to break the contact with the spectators, in order not to remain object of the voyeuristic gaze. Her upraised left hand, then, comes to signify resistance to that gaze, a request to the viewer to turn away. Being alone in this final moment of death by her own hand, she seems to say that she alone can perform it. Even the pitying, sympathizing onlookers that we are, aren't we? How we all pity her. We are still at this moment indiscreet and absolutely uncalled for. That is what that hand and the turning away of the head says. Now, do you want a little break here? Or are you so captivated that you want to go on? Linda wants to go on. Who's against going on? OK, I'll go on. OK. Now, now the dagger. This was about the earring and the face and the hand. Now the dagger. The dagger is, as I said, reduplicated. We see two of them by that shadow. Now, this reduplication of the dagger's point is the second detail, which, if we read it hysterically, or in Naomi Shore's terms, clitorally, clitorally yeah, uh, becomes a major sign, in fact. And it's so tiny, and yet it becomes a major sign. It points to the experience of the rape victim that I briefly talked about already, that she is so much destroyed as a subject that her personality disappears behind that of the rapist. Now, this is really a kind of difficult argument to grasp. But um, I really hope that you, you can see what I mean. Because for me, it's the most crucial thing about rape. The rapist dictates her self-image to her. And you know all those stories where the man, after raping a woman, keeps going, coming back to her and saying, you wanted it, really, huh? I didn't rape you. you in fact, you wanted it. And really wants her to say, yes, I wanted it. Which she might say, because she's in. It's for the man's self-esteem, for whatever reasons. But what it does to the woman is that she is forced to not only to undergo this violence and this violation of her body, but then to say that she wanted it, which then later she tends to confuse and think sometimes that she really did. <coughs> and that's the most horrible thing about rape. This hesitation of the survivor, was I really raped? And you will hear, if you read the stories, you will hear how many of women who have been raped. And even in the most violent, I talked to a person who had been raped, taken out in the middle of the night in a foreign country by two men in a car in the, in, in the middle of a forest. And then the one holding her while the, while the other raped her and the other way around. Now, what could she do? Even this woman came back from this experience with hesitation. And that is the most destroying uh, aspect, in fact. Now, the, rape, the rapist dictates her self-image to her th then. His murder becomes her self-murder. And that is why this is such a perfect representation. This is often expressed in the self-blame. I must have deserved it somehow. Now, what is the logic in this self-blame? The idea that the rape was a punishment. First of all, we have all been brought up that if anything horrible happens to you, it's a punishment, right? Now, a punishment which stems from the feeling that you're worthless, but that feeling that you're worthless, that you're nothing, that you're a piece of shit, in fact. That feeling comes from the rape, from the experience of rape, but then turned around, it takes possession of you and you begin to feel that you were worthless in the first place and that's why you were raped. Now, only by becoming the rapist, and now here is the difficult part of this argument, by becoming the rapist is the woman able to perform the act, to perform an act at all to be someone, an act which, however negative and destructive it may be, is all that is left to her as an illusion of self-determination. 
that is killing yourself or in whatever psychological way destroying yourself by thinking that you deserved it is a way of self-determination that is absolutely negative but it's better than nothing in, in a way. The reduplication of the one, the rapist, by the destruction of the other, the woman, is signified or can be read, let's say, we can think about that when we see this reduplication in the shadow of the dagger. Dagger and penis, of course, the, the choice of the weapon is not random either. Dagger and penis, the weapon of the victim and the weapon of the rapist, become each other's metaphor. The violent penetration of the alien and hard destructive object into her body occurs twice. That is another thing that makes this a, re a representation of rape. The dagger then comes to represent for us the feeling of guilt, which seems to be part of the experience of rape, and which rests on a logical reversal. The thought of being nothing and therefore to have deserved caused the rape. And that sense that, what have I done that has happened to me? I must have done something. Maybe my skirt was too short, or it was a little too late to go out at night, or I shouldn't have put my bike back in the, in, in the basement, or whatever. This reversal is an ultimately desperate means of fighting the destruction, at least partially. One who is guilty exists, like the cogito ergo sum. As long as I'm guilty, I'm there. This reversal of cause and effect, a reversed metonymy, is a cultural commonplace and a very strong one and a very destructive one that we have to address. It fits too well into the culture and that's why it's so easy for women to fall into that trap. Now the person who has been raped cannot live any longer is the message here and she is the first to acknowledge that. And in Livy you will see that she even shouts it from where she stands. She wants to die. She has to be raped again by the dagger, by the public view, by others. Police, court officials, the rapist, uh, rapist's lawyer, and by herself. Now the direction of the dagger in this painting emphasizes this point even more. She directs it to the bosom, the bottom of her bosom. Right? If you follow the line as a, an index, to the vertical middle of her bosom, which is ab the absolute middle of the painting. The composition wherein the white undergarment is the exact center at which the dagger points makes us aware of the display of Lucrezia's body. Just as the penis was directed toward her vagina, that part of her body which, in the eyes of the rapist, defined her synecdochically as a woman and made her rapable. Just so the dagger aims at this figuration of the center of her as a woman. This part so similarly shaped but decently displaced to higher regions of the body. Again, because the, a decent culture would not tolerate a more direct representation. A region representable and visual, her bosom so close to her heart. The bosom is thus metonymically related to the heart, an organ which, according to the commonplace, is the site of or the metaphor for feeling, for self-experience. Now, in Renaissance culture, that is not necessarily true. In, in older cultures, it is the, the abdomen that represents feelings as opposed to the head, which represents ratio. In Renaissance culture, it could be both. And I don't know, I, I don't want to play with that too much. I'm not a historicist, a uh, historian, and uh, let alone a historian of art. But there is this direction to the bosom that seems quite interesting here. There is at the heart of the body, we could say, the dagger, which will perform its destructive penetration. And that figure reminds us again, this displacement from the, the vagina to higher regions, of the wandering womb, emblem of Freudian displacement, and of this uh, reading which attempts to discover what had been repressed. So we are back where we started at displacement. Now, can you still hold out? Just let me know if you want to stop. Um, now look at this one. 
with all the, that in mind. And that's why I wanted you to look for a long time at the other painting to really be able to juxtapose. Now we should in fact have two screens and two projectors, but we cannot have it all. Uh, huh? We could try, maybe, well, for next time. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. I think this will do. You have looked enough at the other one, and we can switch back and forth when, when we compare them. Now, in the light of these remarks about the uh, earlier Lucretia, <coughs> the blowing up, the coming to the fore in the second one is precisely focused on these details that I discussed for the previous one of these meanings. And that strikes me really strongly. Not only is the painting a later product, two years later, it also represents a later phase in the narrative. Lucrezia has already struck. She's bleeding already. And she is, as I'm right in my interpretation of the gown bulging up, she's already falling. She has removed the dagger from the wound, an act which in Livy's story, and this is another important detail, in Livy's story is done by Brutus, one of the onlookers. And Brutus will use the bloody dagger as a sign to begin the revolution, which must end the tyranny of the kings and inaugurate the democracy of the republic. Now, by removing the dagger herself, Lucretia robs Brutus of this opportunity to use her rape for political purposes and, in fact, for his own ambitious ambitions. Apparently, it is important that she keep the dagger in her own hand. Thus, the dagger does not only point to the weapon of the rapist, it also points to the similitude between rape and this use made of it for political purposes, for political interests. And we will have to talk about that more next time, the meaning of that relation between rape and social uh, political um, issues. Now, the dagger in this Lucrezia is directly pointed at her vagina. You see the difference. Let's go back to the other one for a second. Here it points higher. It points to this symbolic place of rape. Here it points simply directly to the place of rape, emphasizing the idea that the, vi the victim compulsorily repeats her rape. She, as, as we, and this is difficult to grasp if you keep thinking of the story, but if you really allow yourself to just see and create the story, produce the story for you out of the visual representation, that's what you get. She does it again. Now, secondly, the, the, the wound, you see that oblong form that represents the wound, and it's the color difference between that wound and the red gown is quite striking and quite interesting as a, as a distinction. The blood stain on the white gown, which looks like a sheet, is so much longer. Again, go back to the other one and you'll see the difference. Here it's really an undergown that, and you see the upper gown and it's just as it should be, costume. In the, in the Renaissance, they, they made, made models wear costumes that had no ambition at all to represent the costume of the antique times that they are representing. That has nothing to do with just costume. Now, here, it's strikingly different. This undergown is kind of indiscreetly brought to the fore and it looks like a sheet. Now this wound is clearly, or not clearly, but I, I think we can take it as a representation of the wounded vagina, displaced again, upward and to the left, yet metaphorically identifiable by its shape, color, and location as the locus of Lucretia's destruction. It's, it's kind of a clear representation. But the gown, the gown which seems blown up compared to the one in the Washington painting, the indiscreet display of her belly represents much more explicitly that, woman, that the woman's body has been raped. This is a much more bodily representation. Raped, that is, wounded, destroyed, and made public. The cord which she held, you know, in her, in her left hand, is that the left hand? Yes. The cord which she held in her left hand, as if for support, now becomes a metonymical representation of the two central events in the aftermath of the rape. And here again, I'm trying to, to put up the narrative out of the visual rather than a pre-established narrative. 
as a bell cord, it can indicate the appeal to the man to whom she is telling the name of the rapist, the father and her husband, her father and her husband, called upon to revenge her, to avenge her. As the cord of a curtain, it can, be, it can indicate the opening of the curtain of the stage, Lucretia's publication, the display of Lucretia. And here I have to say one thing about, um, I promise not to go into historical background, but it is interesting if you look at, uh, I don't know if you have any interest in Rembrandt in particular, but there is a book by Gary Schwartz, Rembrandt, His Life, His Paintings, that is on the reading list, I guess, and that should be in reserve. Uh, he makes the case that many Rembrandt paintings and many paintings contemporary of Rembrandt were done after the stage. And this idea of costume is also part of that. And I don't know if you know about the Polish writer, this wonderful painting that they want to take away now from uh, Rembrandt lovers by saying it's not a real Rembrandt. That, is, that seems to, it seems likely or plausible that that has been made after a representation on the stage of a play where a horse really appeared on stage, which was the event of the year that he did the painting. Now, that allusion to the stage is also an allusion to the artificiality of art, right? Theater, the theatrical and the melodramatic are then part of the poetics of art. We, have, we live on, under the misunderstanding, the, the false assumption that artists have always been out to represent reality as transparently as possible. And that is not at all the case with Rembrandt. And the case I want to make is that emphasis on the artificiality of art does not take art away from reality at all. On the contrary, it places it in reality as a construction with which we live. And I think that this holding of that court is part, among other things, of that project. Now, Lucrezia then has become drama, both within and outside the story. Within, the drama already performed by the rapist unfolds itself again for the man whose property she is. She kills herself for her husband in order to protect his reputation. Outside, Outside of the representation is the dramatic relation between the painting, painterly canvas or theatrical cur curtain, doesn't really matter. And in Dutch, and this is a Dutch artist, uh, it's the same word, doek. It's the same word for the canvas and the curtain. The, 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 the doek falls, the curtain falls, is what you say at the end of a play. And the doek uh, is also the canvas that the painter works on. So. Um, so that allusion seems to be pretty much um, outspoken here. So the relation between the painting and the public, the audience, the, the viewer, the spectators to whose gaze she is subjected. And as the other painting had this desire to ward off the indiscreet gaze of the, the, uh, of the viewer, this one seems to want to draw the curtain onto her as a spectacle. And that's, again, I, I didn't have that same experience, but I could have had it with this painting of feeling that I was indiscreet, that I shouldn't be there. Now, in Livy's story, Lucrezia kills herself for two reasons. Let me look at my watch for a second. Okay, we'll make it. <laughs> she fears for her reputation, which is the obvious thing in all these rape stories. Oh, how horrible uh, that she has been uh, contaminated, polluted, that she will now have a bad reputation. But also, she wants to set an example for other women. And that's quite as disturbingly explicit in the Livy account. Livy makes her say that her suicide must prove her innocence. Now, this is a kind of well-known uh, cliché. And it seems statistics show that the attitude of police uh, in, in rape cases, that is the first people to, to, to where the woman turns to after rape. It's the first thing you go to is a doctor and a police. So the, the experience is quite fresh. They treat women completely differently if they are married or not. And non-married women are much more often suspect of having provoked or having imagined a rape, while married women 
are acceptable rape victims because you would say because they belong to someone and then it's the property that has been violated rather than herself but it also has to do with the idea that married women are kind of cemented in a chaste life and not available publicly while non-married women especially when they have sexual experience are considered vaguely and subconsciously to be a uh, general uh, public uh, property. Now, a culture which makes women believe that they have either caused or <laughs> imagined their rapes, those are the two things, the two cliches about rape that are around, pushes victims towards the self-destruction, which by completing the destruction is called to prove her victimhood, to show, to give evidence. Now, in Livy's text, the rape equals destruction not because it denies the woman's subjectivity, which it does, but because it is an assault on her chastity. Chastity, that is, the exclusive possession of her by a man, another man. And you'll read about this competition. There's an, there an explicit contest between the rapist and the husband about whose wife is the most chaste and beautiful. And that's why this happens. We'll talk about that next week. It's quite uh, fascinating material also. Now, if the self-killing must prove her chastity. The red stain on the white gown, and I, I, I um, prepared you for this by saying it's, rem it's, it's rather kind of a sheet, this long straight piece of white cloth. It can also be seen as an allusion to a very old tradition. The widespread practice of showing the stained sheets as evidence of the bride's virginity the day after the wedding night. The large stain on Lucrezia's belly proves, in quotation marks, by a metonymical allusion to that tradition, that Lucrezia's chastity has been raped. Even if, of course, as a married woman, technically she is not a virgin, but had she been one, we would have the same effect, stains of blood on the sheets. Again, then, we see a redupli reduplication, not of the weapon, but of the raped organ. This reduplication helps us see the representation as a story, but a visually based story. Not exactly the story of the tradition from Livy onwards. And I'm emphasizing this because I think that Rembrandt could, was able to use visuality to construct a story different from the sources. Sources in quotation marks, in huge quotation marks, because first of all, we don't know if he used the text at all. I think not. I think he just used a story that was around, and it was around on the basis of, among other sources, Livy's. But um, he was able to use visuality to, to construct a different story. The verbal text by Livy and the visual text by Rembrandt, I use the word text here with some hesitation. I know that art historians don't like it, but I am addressing this as a text. So I think I can use a text in this, uh, the word text in this respect. Now, in other words, the verbal texts of Livy and the visual texts by Rembrandt are related, but not as a hierarchy of primary to secondary text, in which this would be an illustration of the primary text, or a story and illustration. Then. The painting represents its own interpretation of rape as a deadly, uh, of rape as a deadly experience, as deadly by conveying, no, sorry. Let me start again this sentence. The painting represents its own, rep its own interpretation of rape as deadly by conveying the suggestion of a succession of two moments. And this is then the narrative, that, the visual narrative, two moments. The moment before the rape and the moment after the rape. Read hysterically, the slit in the top of the gown depicts this, the chaste nightgown of the innocently sleeping Lucrezia when the rapist, comes into her, the rapist comes into her bedroom. And the lower, bloody slit depicts her wound, her femininity intact before and wounded after the rape. The two slits, two, two vertical slits. The two moments are related to each other in several ways. Links which constitute the structure of visual narrative. In a narrative perspective, that they succeed each other. You first have the first and then the second. And in our culture, we're used to, take from, to go from top to bottom, right? And from left to right. So this makes sense as a sequence. As metonymy, they are causally related. 
and as metaphor they represent each other. Together they, they figure the displacement of hysterics. <coughs> the diagonal cord, that sash that she's wearing, instead of the necklace in the other painting, or chain or whatever it is, we can't see really, relates these two moments to moments of innocence and safety on the one hand, to wounding and mortal terror on the other. The cord leads our gaze from, if we follow it, it leads our gaze from the first moment to the second. And by thus making us aware of the movement of our gaze, the cord has a critical potential. That is, it makes us aware of what we do as spectators if we take the time to do this narrative. It breaks the stillness and the abstraction of the gaze. And I refer here to Norman Bryson's important book, uh, The Logic of the, uh, no, Vision and Painting, The Logic of the Gaze, which is on your reading list. And there is a chapter there called The Gaze and the Glance. And this distinction, we'll talk about it uh, three weeks from, four weeks from now in more detail. But I can tell you already what the distinction is about. I have 10 more minutes. Um, the glance is the quick look that does, that it's a quick look, but it's also the look that engages you as a viewer. The gaze is a kind of objectifying look that disengages from yourself and from your own body. That is the spectator who is comfortable comfortably established in a gallery and can objectify this as an object, as something that you cannot really reach, but you can just uh, submit by looking at it. The gaze is that objectifying look. The glance is the quick look, but it's also the look where you participate. It's as if you run into someone. Looking at this as in a glance does not mean that you have to do it quickly, but it means that you are you run into her literally, and and you then you say, hey, it's kind of tangible way of looking, and that is what you need in order to first construct that narrative of rape that you see if you compare those two slits, but then also to realize that you are doing that. So the, the, the glance is the look that engages yourself. Now, as a result, if you do that, you become participant in Lucrezia's stories. And the question, which role is open to us, becomes a little disturbing. And I would like to end on that disturbing question that you can then think of about for next week. Thank you. There are questions. I'm sorry, I left so little time for questions. Let me turn this off. Can we turn the light on? Yeah. Or do you need the slides? Actually, can I see the second slide again? Because what struck me when you were talking about how Rembrandt's visuality differs from the narrative tradition, it struck me that his visuality differs from the visual tradition. And at least two, two ways it struck me right away. It's just like it's going to be really John Berger. And He's, he has a couple of sort of pithy remarks about gender representations in painting, and one of them is that in paintings, men act or do or look, and women are looked at. Mm -hmm. the past yes. And in both of these, but most clearly, I think maybe in this one, you get not only woman acting or having acted, in the first one, acting perhaps even more, uh, but looking. In the first one, shows a way that even that, I suppose, is an active thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Way. And the other thing is that when he talks about perspective, he talks about how, I think the way he puts it is, we look up to princes and down on nudes. And, and here we look up to her. Right. Which is quite interesting. That is true. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really interesting remark. Also, the previous one about uh, her looking. Looking away is a very strong way of looking. It's confronting you with your position as onlooker. Milena? Yes, um, I have two questions. Do you need the slides? No, no. Okay. Can we have the light? Yeah, I know. We had enough of her, maybe. Uh, Rembrandt, he actually subjectivizes the narrative. He projects Lucre uh, Lucretia's story. He actually tells her story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Isn't it the difference between the visual representation and the verbal how is it in the, I don't recall how it is in the verbal narrative, 
is it from the point of view of Lucretia or the We'll talk about that next week at, at length because then we are going to really address the verbal uh, stories. Yeah. It, is, it is really, uh, I, I'm glad that it came across that um, without making, turning Rembrandt into a feminist, I think that he strongly allows for feminist readings uh, because it's, 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 there is a perspective of, of the woman, of the victim here. Yeah. Although he also buys in this metaphor of rape of suicide as a metaphor for rape, he still allows, and that includes uh, Linda's remark about her looking, even if she looks away, which is an active way of directing our gaze. We'll come to talk about the viewer and looking in the paintings uh, in three weeks in more in detail, but uh, you're absolutely right that there is a very strong sense of her being the center of focus, not only in the sense that you look at her, but also that she is the focalizer. Of, of the experience, and that is quite remarkable. And you'll see in the verbal accounts, especially in, uh, in Livy, I really have accounts to settle with that guy. Livy quotes her. There is du direct discourse, which is a way of pretending that she says those things, and the things she says are just horrible. It's like, I kill myself because no woman will ever be able to say, you can go unpunished after this. That kind of things. So. That is really the extreme opposite that is making her focalize something that is in fact a male focalization. And that is quite the opposite of this. Yes. And now your point is, is this related to visuality? Yes. Right. Now. Or to Rembrandt. Yes, to Rembrandt rather to visuality. I should, what I should have done, and maybe we can do it, is there a strong art, art history uh, slide library here? Well, we'll talk about it. I'll send you to, <laughs> to dig it up. It would be interesting to look at other Lucrecias from other painting, painters. Now, what usually happens with this kind of stories, the Susanna and the Elders is another one that we'll talk about. Um, that is that it's used for pornography, to just say it point blank. Uh, the, the victimhood of a woman is represented in order to kind of rhetorically represent, rhetorically it's okay to, to use this story because then you cannot be accused of pornography because it is this tradition. But what in fact happens is it's just an occasion to display a body. And I think Rembrandt, although there is the sense of display, I don't want to categorize him as either feminist or sexist. I hate that anyway, to put people in, in these categories so quickly. But he is let's say, a product of the culture that deals with rape in the way it does, but he also deconstructs it by showing the mechanisms, by showing how we are able to say this is a metaphor for rape, and that w putting that foregrounding, the devices, is a way of undercutting it, of sh undermining it, and showing that it is a device. And that's what, what I wanted to say with art, the artificiality of art, being the real thing, being what it relates are to reality, rather than the transparent representation of so-called reality, which is always false anyway. So I, I really s think that it is related to Rembrandt, and I think that's the surplus this artist has compared to his traditions, although he's a very traditional artist in certain ways, is the surplus of meaning that comes on top of the traditional meanings that make him into a uh, this great master of art of all times. Which is not a way to say that he's ahistorical, but uh, that he is still very interesting and we can work with it. And I think that we can learn from Rembrandt about rape, for example. It needs us to do it, but we can do it. And that is something that you cannot do with all the, uh, the cases. Now, in the bibliography for the course, the course or seminar, how do you call it? Seminar, I guess. There is an article by Mary Garrant uh, about Susanna. It's called Artemisia and Susanna. That article is not on the Lucrezia tradition, but on the Susanna tradition, which is also a very strong tradition of a victimized woman used for pornographic purposes. And what she does is what I would have liked to do if I had another life uh, with the Lucrezia traditions. And you will see that it's really interesting how she argues for a female author for a painting that is sometimes attributed to Artemisia Gentileschi and sometimes to her father, Octavio 
Gentil Lasky, who was also her teacher. So you see the, the intricacy of the problem of attribution. And her argument is really strong, and it, it's less detailed because she goes through the whole tradition, but it is really comparable to what I was trying to do. I could almost say that I made an argument for a female hand here. And that hand is called Rembrandt, <laughs> which proves for you guys that you can be good feminists. 